Austin Association dedicates every month to a different department, and March is Environmental Health Month. Um, my name is Amanda Quintana, and I'm the Environmental Health Department Liaison. So we put together this panel because a lot of us, most of us, are graduating in May, and if you're not graduating, you're just curious as to what you can do with your MPH degree, especially with the Environmental Health Department um, coursework we've been taking. So we have a panel group here who have really impressive resumes and backgrounds, and I've tried very hard to minimize their introductions. I'm going to give an introduction to each of them and then pose a few questions to have them answer, and we'll open the floor to discussions. Um, with me today, who's going to be holding the open floor discussion is Joanna Prograsky here. She's also in public custody association with me. Um, you can help yourself to some food outside and water right, as well. All right. So I'm going to get this correct. Um, Dr. Michaels is not here right now, no. so I'm going to start with you. Oh, you are here. Yeah, Dr. Howard's not here. Dr. Howard, sorry. Okay, so we have, okay, I'll start with you. We have, David Michaels. You're not going to read all that. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. No, no, it's too much. Okay. So David Michaels is currently, um, he serves as the United States Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health and is on a leave of absence from the university currently because he's fulfilling his position. Um, Dr. Michaels is also the author of Doubt is Their Product, How Industries Assault on Science Threatens Your Health and was nominated by President Clinton as um, the Department of Energy's Assistant Secretary for Environment, Safety, and Health. In the past, Dr. Michaels has received several awards, one of which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award for his work on behalf of nuclear weapons workers and for his advocacy for scientific integrity. And then next to him, we have Dr. Lynn Goldman. Um, She's the Dean of Milken Institute School of Public Health. And prior to her position here, she worked at John Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. And she was a professor there in the environmental health sciences. Prior to joining Hopkins, Dr. Goldman was Assistant Administrator for Toxic Substances in the US Environmental Protection Agency from 1993 to 1998 under President Bill Clinton. And Dr. Goldman also worked in environmental health for the California Department of Public Health Services a lot more than that, so, okay. And then George Gray, who's also here with us today, is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health here and the director of the Center for Risk Science and, Pu and Public? Science and Public? Public Health. Oh, Public Health, we missed that here. Um, prior to joining the Milken Institute School of Public Health in 2010, Professor Gray served as assistant administrator for the EPA's Office of Research and Development and as the agency science advisor. Um, he's also executive director, or was executive director, of the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis and a member of the faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, during his government service, Professor Gray served on several committees, such as the National Science and Technology Council and co-chaired the National Nanotechnology Environmental Health Initiative. Um, he was also on the FDA Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition and National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And I should give a little brief introduction for John Howard. Um, okay, so Dr. Howard, who's not here right now, is the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and in the, in the US Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Howard also serves as the administrator of the World Trade Center Health Program in the US Department of Health and Human Services. He was first appointed NIOSH director and under George Bush administration and was a consultant with the U.S. government's Afghanistan Health Initiative and was again appointed NIOSH director in, under the Barack Obama administration. He is a member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar and is a professional lecturer here in Milk Institute of Public Health. Okay, great. So, um, I have a few questions to ask the panel. Um, and the first one is just about a brief background of your career path. So many Milken students will be graduating in about a little over a month, and a lot of them are curious to know what the first job each of you had after graduating with your said degree, 
whether it be with your PhD, MD, MS, and PH. Um, would you be able to tell us about your first job after graduating and the career path that followed to bring you to where you are today? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I took it somewhat um, <coughs> circuitous path. Uh, I was actually a, a history student as an undergraduate and got a job afterwards at Rikers Island in New York City. Uh, prisoners are the only people in the United States who are the, oh, there's Dr. Howard. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. You were in your days. Yeah. Good. So, so well, I'm going to do it. Anyway, this, okay. the uh, Supreme Court had ruled some year, years earlier that if you take away someone's liberty, you have to feed them and you have to give them shelter and you have to give them medical care. And uh, in New York City, at the time, the city health department ran the uh, Rikers Island Infirmary and did terrible jobs. They gave the, the contract to a hospital in the Bronx called Montefiore Hospital. And I was hired by people at Montefiore to help out and be a research assistant. I was, you know, I had a bachelor's degree and no real background. Um, I was working on that and two people really um, influenced me greatly. One was uh, Mervyn Susser, who wrote a book called Causal Thinking in the Health Sciences. And someone gave me this book and I read it. And I said, I want to be an epidemiologist. I have no background at all, but it's a, it's a fabulous book. He was a, a close friend of Nelson Mandela. He sort of worked in the uh, ANC in South Africa. He was in exile in the United States, but he wrote that book. I think it was the England book. book, book. So I read that and said, well, this is a great way to describe the world. And then Tony Mazaki, who was a leader of the World Chemical Atomic Workers Union, set up a program at Montefiore to train medical students and others using workers to teach them occupational health. And I got involved helping in that. And that was my sort of career path set that way. I got involved in occupational health and in um, uh, epidemiology. And I did, until I got more into policy, I crunched numbers. I did studies in epidemiology of worker health issues. And I ran worker mm -hmm. education programs and um, did some you know, helping employers address safety health um, issues. But I think the interesting point to make is that I took sort of a I, I didn't take a clear um, path that you would predict it. Actually ended up choosing, making choices which looked like they were sort of backwaters or, or making choices that said these aren't the high prestige places. But out of that came much more interesting work. You know, I was on the faculty at Einstein College of Medicine, which is a very prestigious place. And I got offered a position at a small fast track medical school at City College in New York, which is very unprestigious. Um, but it was a wonderful place to go, and I enjoyed it tremendously, even though the chairman of my department, Einstein, thought I was just a fool to leave you know, the, the center of academia, like, um, to, to go to this sort of backwater place. Similarly, I had a um, Robert with Johnson Health Policy Fellowship, which brought me first to Washington from New York, where I worked in Congress. And all of my colleagues went to work in the Senate, and I went to work in the House. And this was in 1994, 93, when Congress considered the President Clinton's health reform proposal. And I had a fabulous time and was given a lot of responsibility because there was no one else there to work on the stuff. Well, the Senate was just filled with all these experts. And so I think that the interesting thing that I sort of learned is sometimes the, the, um, the more prestigious path is necessarily the one to get you to, to the most enjoyable and, and um, rewarding, not necessarily uh, financially, but really sort of psychically and professionally rewarding place. So. Maybe I'll go. Um so I actually developed an interest in environmental health when I was an undergraduate, and I was in Berkeley, and I was in um, a program called Conservation of Natural Resources that allowed us to <coughs> customize making um, a interdisciplinary program, and, and I, you know, did environmental health, wrote my senior thesis about pesticides, um, actually the use of pesticides for the fire ant program. Um, I'm from um, Texas, and I was aware of that, so I thought that was pretty fascinating. And, and I especially loved um, the agriculture library there. They still had things like the old pamphlets showing firemen carrying off lands and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I um, did medical training, uh, pediatric residency, and, uh, and, and master's in public health at, um, at Hopkins. And, went into um, environmental epidemiology for the state health department um, in California. And I guess in a way, like David also, you know, um, was, um, I was kind of the person that took the projects that nobody else wanted, you know. And so I worked on epidemiology related to hazardous waste sites and exposures for communities. 
got very um, interested in, in the use of geographic information systems, now we call it big data, and, um, but also in, in, um, in public communications, risk communication, both in the public, I spend a lot of time um, with the public in meetings um, with them, um, working with various groups. Helped to start the lead poisoning prevention program there, but more and more kind of, you know, uh, and also did um, <laughs> the other thing was mass cancer clusters, which was also fascinating to work on. And, and even this, um, this work that I did at this um, nuclear research facility in Southern California called Rocket Dime, which is where I met David, right. because I, I appointed him to be a member of the advisory committee to us. And, and I also <laughs> met John then, because he was at Cal OSHA, so we you now had this meeting with us. But became more engaged with, with policy and, and, and national issues uh, through uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics mostly, but also the Association of State Health Officers. And, so I always found that, for me, to be a good way to begin to bridge from being more of a, of a scientist and also somebody who's doing work at the community level to working on policy, to kind of in a context of helping uh, the, the, the pediatric academy develop policy statements and things like that. And which is how I think I ended up being selected to, um, to go to EPA in the Clinton administration. Um, and then, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of getting to do public health practice, um, you know, as an epidemiologist, um, public health practice as a regulator, much like um, David is now, you know, actually been a regulator, um, is a little bit unusual, um, most of us never um, actually get to do that, and, and, and then after that going to, um, to Hopkins, where I had a bit of an academic career. Well, I guess I'd say you can't plan it anyway. You, know, you, you can't plan where you're going to end up. But <clears throat> all of us have, have interest that we followed. I came out of um, an undergraduate program in biology, and I, I wanted to do something kind of applied. I chose toxicology for my PhD degree. I got done with that, and I said, this isn't very applied. And I went off to a postdoc <laughs> in something called environmental health and public policy. And I, Stopped working in a laboratory. My advisor told me I was throwing my career away. You could be a good scientist, you know. Um, but instead, I, I, I found that this world of applying science to public health decisions to be something that, um, that interested me. And I've had a great opportunity to work with lots of different people. And I think one of the things that is an advantage you have coming out of school of public health is you've rubbed shoulders with people in a lot of different fields. And I'll tell you, one of the things that when you get out there as a scientist working in public health, it's really important, is having, having basic respect for other fields in what they do. That lets you work with them better, it lets you communicate with them better, and it lets you do things that you couldn't do most of the time if you didn't have those other people around. So one of the things I'd urge you to do is to, to, to continue to look broadly and opportunities to do things that might look a little different. One of the biggest influences on my thinking that I've ever had came when I was a toxicologist and always done chemicals and things like that. And the United States Department of Agriculture came to me and said, can you do a risk assessment for mad cow disease? <laughs> and then, sure. <laughs> you know, so we jumped in and did it. But it required learning a whole new kind of science working with veterinarians and people like that I hadn't spent time with. Um, but it really stretched the way that I thought about risk. It stretched the way that I thought about public health. It thought, stretched the way that I thought about how you can, the tools you can use to inform really important decisions. Like, what the heck does that country do when we find a mad cow? So be willing to, as you hear, kind of be open. Things will move. Do things that stretch you and find a way to work with people who who complement what you know. And again, coming out of a school of public health, you guys have had classes in, in leadership and in FE and global health, and environmental health, and social behavior, all that. You're going to need all of that when you get out there to be a public health professional. And remember that those people have lots of lots of skills, lots of abilities that can help you get done what you want to do. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, he won. And <laughs> who would have ever thought he could have beat Diane Fine? Anyway, she ran for the Senate. She's still in the Senate. So, so he won. And um, I got this, uh, uh, you know, bu uh, pamphlet in the mail saying, "Apply for, you know, one of these jobs, a political job." <laughs> and so I checked, you know, a couple things related to the Department of Health. But I forgot that on my resume, you know, it said that I had done an occupational medicine residency and that I was board certified. Anyway. The state had just defunded the OSHA program. The governor had defunded the OSHA program, making federal OSHA's life miserable at the time because California had to be covered. The voters got so upset, and in California we have you know, like a Greek democracy so we can do initiatives, and they passed an initiative restoring the program. Everybody in California, except for me, because I've been in Washington, had been involved on one side or the other of this huge initiative. So when somebody in the governor's office saw that I had occupational, all of a sudden I had an interview with the Secretary of Labor said, well, you'd be perfect for Cal OSHA. I said, I don't even know what this is. You know? And I've never managed anything in my entire life. My secretary, who I share with five other professors at UCI, never, never even pays any attention to what I say. Said, no, 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 you're fine. You'll, you'll be great. And I ended up a decade later at Cal OSHA. And, um, then I decided that, you know, I think I need to get out of this job. I think, you know, this is a decade is enough. And um, I saw that there was, uh, the director of NIOSH had just left to come to UCLA. Um, and so I went and talked to her, and she said, oh, yeah, you should definitely apply. And I said, but I'm not a researcher. I don't, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So I applied. And because I had worked for a Republican governor, mind you, this was a Republican administration, a Bush administration. So without any degree of merit, uh, <laughs> in Washington, merit never hurts, but you know, it doesn't really get you a job eventually. Um, uh, that's how I got to where I am. I was subsequently fired by the Bushes. Um, and then uh, went into exile for a while. And then I got a call uh, saying from the from the Obama people saying we want to reappoint you. Now I don't know how this happens, but you know, it happens. And that was my story. But we in the State Health Department love having you at Cal Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just so you know. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so we know you can practice environmental and occupational health in many sectors, such as NGOs, private and public sectors, and the government. Which skills do each of you feel were strengthened or weakened in some of your positions, and what did you take from these positions that you'd be able to share with us? No, I just did. Okay. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, there are many skills, but I think in some ways, a, a key one in public health is advocacy. And advocacy really is a skill. And it's something that we should be teaching. And if you want to be effective in impacting public health, advocacy plays a very important role. It's not the only role you could be sort of you could be a scientist doing research, things like that, but advocacy is a very important role. And so within that, you know, what's really important is to learn how to write well, you have to speak publicly well. Because um, you're always in situations where you have to um, convince people of the importance and the truth of what you're saying. Um, you have to be well versed in, in the scientific background of the areas you're looking into because um, you're not convincing without you know, being at ease with the science and being right also. And you have to be really respectful of the science. Um, but you also have to understand, I don't know if it's psychology or you know, what is the most people. Uh, I was in, when I was in uh, working, I had a job uh, at City College, which is in Harlem, and um, I had just come from working at Montreux in the Bronx, and these were like two of the centers of the HIV epidemic in the 80s in New York. And um, I was asked the question, of, um, you know, what do we do about all these kids who are losing their mothers to HIV? These are women who are either drug users or the sexual partners of drug users, and you know, this was before any sort of treatment of HIV, and there were, you know, women all through the Harlem and the Bronx who were dying of AIDS and leaving kids who were healthy. And so what do we do about that? And I worked with a number of people at both of the institutions that want to address that. And so a question came up, you know, how many are there? How many kids have been uh, orphaned by AIDS? And since I was sort of the numbers person, I worked out an uh, Excel spreadsheet, essentially a, a pretty straightforward mathematical model based on fertility rates 
um, it predicted the number of children that would die of AIDS, uh, children whose mothers would die of AIDS. We published it in JAMA, and it was very important in convincing first the New York State Legislature and then the federal government that um, there were a lot of kids who were going to die, who were going to be orphaned because their mothers died of AIDS, and they needed this program. And what was interesting is we had all these kids, but until you had a number, people didn't take them seriously. On the other hand, the number alone didn't really move people. The stories were what moved people, but you need both. Um, what I realized later, you know, the number really probably didn't make a difference. If I had said 10,000 or 100,000, there were never going to be enough services for all of them, but you had to be able to sort of combine both these things to sort of make the case for why you need to do that. And eventually, the, that model was used in giving out Ryan White money and sort of, you know, helping bereavement programs and other social service programs all around the country. Um, but sort of thinking about what, you know, what do you need to move people to make the right decisions around these things? And so I think that's really useful to figure out. I mean, I would say initially in public health, because I was dealing with things that everybody was concerned about all the time. So I didn't have to go out and rip up the concern. But it was more of a matter of time to um, learn how to discern very quickly what was important and and needed time and attention and and what wasn't and how to bring those things to a close. Uh, you know, a typical week um, when I was in public health would end at about 4 p.m. on a Friday with a call about some crazy thing. And, um, you know, uh, release of something on a schoolyard or a cluster or, you know, or somebody um, who was maybe lead poisoned or, or something like that. And being able to to pretty quickly determine, you know, you know, is this real or not? Is something actually happening? Like, do I really need to spend my weekend doing this? Or can I quickly, um, you know, actually look at the data and say, well, wait a minute, this is not unusual. Somebody's really upset about it, but it's not actually unusual. And um, and I guess also, you know, kind of along the same lines, um, figuring out, being able to, to chart a course toward, okay, um, proactively, what did I want to be working on? What would be the most important thing I could be working on, that, not just to address immediate issues, that, because in a state health department, you're in a swirl of the immediate. There are just a lot of things flying around. But how do I chart a course toward um, addressing issues on a more fundamental level? And so in my experience, there it was a decision to try to create a lead poisoning prevention program because we didn't have one and we knew that was a really important public health problem. And just programming time for that and building the support for that and 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 an issue where maybe the parents weren't complaining about it all the time because they were too poor and they didn't understand what the problem was. They didn't know their kids were lead poisoned. And um, but you know it was our job to to build the support for that. But um, you know the, the that that was very important to learn and um, something I'm still trying to do. Thank you.